Hi, my first discussion will be about um, getting uh, these, um, well, it will be about transformations of exponential functions. And your first thing to do would be to, I, I mean, what I would do is I would ask you, I would just send you this link to Desmos, and you yourself can play around with these four parameters notice how uh, they are arranged in f of x. My only, my only thing is that um, it would be interesting to know, note um, what resulting function will you have as a result of transforming your functions. So that would be, that would be something that would be uh, a good question. Like for example, the parent function I'll just show you just the parent function. So the parent function here is 3 to the x. As usual, it passes through the point 0, 1, just like all these functions do that simply have a base and a, and a x in the exponent. Whenever you have that, you have just a, um, you have a, a function which passes through the point 0, 1. Of course, all of these all of these conventions can be broken. We can move, like for example, this asymptote, which we were talking about in earlier lessons, can move up or down. Uh, this y-intercept can move up or down uh, using these transformations. At the same time, uh, this curve will either become more gradual or more steep, or it will, or you will end up with a decreasing function or an increasing function right? And as we said earlier, a exponential function typically increases or decreases throughout its domain, meaning that uh, if, if it's increasing in one part of the domain, it's increasing in all parts of the domain. The other thing is, if it's decreasing in one part of the domain, it's also decreasing in all parts of the domain. Uh, we showed you that in an earlier video. Um, I don't want to have to rehash that. Just go back to the earlier videos regarding some of the properties. I think it was linked to 3.4, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 3.3. But um, I'm just going to show you, we're just going to discuss this in general. This is a very brief lesson because I really think you would learn a lot better simply by doing this stuff yourself. Uh, my first, uh, the first thing I will say, and if you really are stuck for time, you can just hear me say this and just stop the video and move on to the next lesson if you want. <laughs> uh, uh, this might be all you need to know, that the transformations of an exponential function run exactly the same way as transformations of all other functions we've seen in the course. There are no changes to any of the rules, even though it may appear that something else is going on, some other kind of strangeness is going on with these exponential functions. Well, no, it's just the nature of the curves. It looks strange, but really a shift so many units this way is just like a shift so many units this way for all functions. Um, or a shift so many units this way, or a stretch this way, or a stretch or compression this way kind of thing. They're the same for all functions, uh, and exponential functions are no different. If that's all you need to know, then just do the homework exercises just to verify that you completely understand this totally. Uh, otherwise, you can stick around for the rest of this video. It won't be, I, I promise this won't be a long lesson. Uh, there isn't much to say. First of all, notice that uh, when I wrote g of x, I did it using the same convention as we used for all other functions in the course. We have a times f of some, you know, stretch factor like this called k. I'm, I'm calling it k now. I don't know what they call it in the book. What do they call it in the book? Just hold on a second. Um, looks like they didn't use it at all in the book, but hey, I'm using it. And then x minus d plus c. Now the d and the c, if you recall, uh, d was the left and right shift and the c is the up and down shift. If you notice one of the consequences on, on a curve like this of an up and down shift 
is that this horizontal asymptote is going to move up and down with the up and down shift. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And it'll move C units. In other words, the asymptote itself will move C units along with the up and down shift. The left and right shift, however, what does that change? Well, it can change the x-intercept, or sorry, it can change the y-intercept, um, and the also the k could pr possibly change the uh, um, the y-intercept as well. Uh, manipulating a does not change the x-intercept. Actually, no, it does. No, that does too. Matter of fact, why don't we just prove this to ourselves? First of all. Um, notice that when I click on g of x to show its graph, it's totally not the same graph. And that's because some of these uh, coefficients are not really set to where they should be. Uh, we have a equals 1 and k equals 1, but it turns out really this is shift up, shifted up by one unit. And notice the consequence of shifting uh, the red curve, the original parent function 3 to the x, up by one unit and that the asymptote is now uh, y equals 1, the uh, horizontal asymptote. And also, the um, c also changes the y-intercept uh, a fair bit. Okay. Um, now, let us... Uh, another thing, too, is that the... Um, uh, um, d has also shifted... Um, the graph uh, to the right. So I have d equals 1. Notice d is positive 1, but notice there's a minus sign in front of the d, so it's shifting it in the positive direction, um, indicated by d equals positive 1. The negative sign is part of the formula up here, but if we now make d equal to 0, we can see that, okay, it looks like one curve is entirely above the other. Uh, it's not clear what's happening as we go to a very high value, but it appears as though that um, the two curves are very much above each other. And this is what I mean by the strangeness between the two curves. There is a, you know, a simple shift upward and nothing else going on still makes this crazy pattern that when you increase the graph, well, if you zoom in, they are separate, they never run into each other, and they're never equal, <laughs> right? Um, so this is a transformation, and it's a transformation upward by one unit. It just doesn't look that way here. It doesn't look like it's a transformation up by one unit, but it turns out that if we go, if we look at this and we go directly above that, the point here is directly above the point here. So don't get fooled by this optical illusion-y horizontal distance because really the vertical shift only looks at the vertical distance so even in a place like this um, the shift is directly upward by one unit um, so don't get fooled by that it's a lot more obvious over here you can see that we're going from one to two and we're going from zero to one over here roughly roughly speaking uh, not exactly though because that's an asymptote so it's really just above zero to just above one kind of thing okay uh that is that is that now of course to show you that i'm not bluffing we'll manipulate c so that c is zero and now they are both the same curve now g of x is equal to f of x so g of x has a equals one and k equals one and the other parameters equal to zero, okay? So, and by the way, this is true for all functions you will study in the course and all functions you will study in advanced functions in grade 12. This is the way it works, okay? The default values are these. Um, that a equals one, k equals one, d equals zero, c equals zero. Make the two functions equal to each other. Make the transformed function equal to the parent, okay? Um, it's when we start mucking about with A and K and D and C that then we get our transformations. Then the points occupied by the parent function become these transform points by stretches and shifts and compressions and whatnot. Okay? Um, 
so let's take one at a time. Let's look at A. And when we increase A, notice the blue curve. That's our transform curve. Red is always our parent function, right? Red is the parent function. When we increase A, well, that actually stretches everything upward vertically. Now, the thing is, you might notice a parallelism. It's like the horizontal distance is the same distance apart up here. Again, that's an optical illusion. Yes, they are the same distance apart. And there's a reason. Logarithms. Don't say that I said that, okay? But it's about logarithms. I just corrupted the youth of Ontario here. Okay, so logarithms, which we're, I'm not supposed to mention, is the reason. <laughs> yeah, the shift, I think, is of log A or something. And the log of 10 is 1. And that's a shift of 1. Hey, look at that. It is a shift of 1. So we go to 10. The log of 10 is 1. And uh, no, not quite. Eh? It's just 1 and a bit. I don't know. Well, anyway. So if A is 10, uh, okay. Um, probably, I don't know if the log is based on a base 3. But anyway, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. Well, I'm not going to go there. We're not going to talk about logs. Okay. So that's the reason. Don't look at that shift. Don't, that, that's nothing. It's actually, we just stretch it vertically by a factor of 10. What does that mean? Well, it means that a point here on the graph, if you look at the Y coordinate, the Y coordinate is one, you multiply it by 10 and you get that stretch factor. You get where that function is on the graph, right? On, on the transformed graph. So here we get 0, 10, and if we look here, we get 0, 1, and of course 1 times 10 is 10. So that's pretty obvious. If we go to here, negative 2, uh, negative 2, let's see, can we get negative 2 exactly? I wish we could. Uh, you know what? How about this? How about if we do f of... I don't know, f of 2. So f of 2 is 9. We'll do g of 2. Now, g of 2, if, if we're right about these stretch factors, g of 2 should be 90, right? Because we have to multiply 9 by 10 to get the other point. So g of 2 is, in fact, 90. You can see that right there. There it is. It's 90. So it's actually... So actually, any, any f of x is 10 times more than what it should be, and we can keep going with this. How about f of negative 0 0.1? We get some funky decimal, um, 3 to the negative 0.1. Okay, I, was, I wasn't expecting a nice number. Actually, I don't know if we... Anyway, if we do g of negative 0.1 it should be the same decimal multiplied by 10, right? So let's do this. G of negative 0 0.1. There it is. It's the same digits, except it's multiplied by 10. So you can see this is true for any point on the graph. <coughs> we, can, we can make this into um, like f of, f of 5. And then 3 to the power 5, which is what 243 is. Okay. That means that G of 5 must be 2,430. So, and, and it is, as you can see. So that's what the stretch factor does. This is what the stretch factor always did for every function you've ever studied so far. Um, this, you know, it'll work. This kind of thinking will work for polynomials. It'll work for any function, any function, even logarithms, but it'll also work for exponential functions. All we did was multiply the function by 10. That's all we're doing. That's all we're doing, generally speaking, in for functions in general. That's what this a equals 10 means. All right, so let's uh, rid ourselves of that. Let's now take a look. Let's just set a equal to 1. And let's look at k all by itself. And let's make it equal to, say, 5. 
Now, what does it mean for, let's see, let's do F, F of 5. F of 5 was 243. Uh, actually, why, why am I preoccupied with 5? We'll say F of 2. F of 2 is 9. We'll choose a simple number, right? 3 squared. 3 squared is 9. And then we'll uh, do G of 2. What's G of 2? What does that give us? <coughs> oh, my God. 59,049. My God, that's that's a that's amazingly huge. Um, and why is that? That's because it's five. Oh. Oh, so if you remember that over here you're passing you're passing this as a substitution for x. Anything that's in here, including the k, right? We're manipulating k right now k is 5, all the others are set to just neutral values, but k is the only one that's not really neutral. And f of 2 means 3 to the power 2 up here, right? But when we say g of 2, what's that? Well, that means this is 2, d is 0, so 2 minus 0 is still 2. But then we got 5 times 2, 5 times 2 is 10. So when we pass this whole thing up, we're passing a 10 into f of x, and this becomes 3 to the power 10, which is why the number is so ginormous. It's huge, right? We got 59,049. Well, how, how is it? Can we get the same number? Can we get the number 9? Can we manipulate x to get the number 9 again? It turns out we can, because we know that 5 is is what k is, right? So we got to make x to compensate for that. You know, whatever whatever is passed into the exponent now is 5 times what it would normally be if it was just the parent function. Now it's now it's going to be 5 times that. Well, to compensate, we can make x 1 fifth of 2, right? So that's 2 over 5 or 0 0.4. Let's try 0 0.4. And it turns out, yay, we get the same answer. Zero point, so g of 0 0.4 gives us the same answer. We pass that into, into here, 0 0.4 times 5, right, is 2.0. And then 3 to the power 2.0 is 3 squared, which is 9. There you go. Okay, so... Sometimes you have to think a little differently about these functions to see what is exactly going on. Um, okay. Um, so 3 squared is 9. Oh. See, we got 2, 9. f of 2 is 9, which is the same thing as saying 3 squared equals 9. All right, um, let's, uh, let's do something else. Uh, of course, we could also, um, let's just restrict our discussion to A and K for a minute. What if A is negative? Well, if A is negative, let's just make it negative one. Well, uh, if we have three squared, the parent function is nine but if we say g of 2 here, if this is g of 2, we get negative 9. And that's because what's happening is that 2 is being passed into 3 of x, but because there's a minus 1 in front of the whole function, okay, um, it, it's sort of like this. I could do this using, I th think I can do this using OneNote, except I don't have my mouse hooked up. But the idea is, let's go into draw mode. Um, if we have something like um, negative 3 squared, what's happening is that because of bed mass, because of bed mass, remember, this is like minus 1 multiplied by 3 squared, right? And so bed mass tells us that the exponent has to be solved first. So this is equal to negative 1 times 9, right? 
and this is now that's why you're getting negative nine in Desmos okay um, so that's what's happening um, and that's why when a is negative you have to simply you have to do the exponent first and then multiply by a right in fact that's true for all cases even when a is positive you do the exponent first and then you multiply by a that's bed mass anyway right um, remember exponents for bed mass it's brackets exponents division multiplication addition subtraction those are the order of operations and they pretty much take you through uh, nearly all cases in algebra so um, we have basically notice that the y-intercept here is 1 the y-intercept here is minus 1 so we definitely change the y-intercept um, and if we stretch a even further make make it equal to negative 3 let's say it just means that everything becomes triple right so what would normally be f of x would be just 3 times f of x with a minus sign. So negative 3 times f of x. So every, every, uh, every x value you pass into f of x would simply be multiplied by minus 3. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's uh, take a look at um, shifts. Um, so notice that these shifts look suspiciously like these stretches right in fact um, because of logarithms they are they are kind of the same but we're just going to treat them as separate ideas so a is remember your vertical stretch and d is going to be just your horizontal shift um, so you're gonna you're gonna find that you know, some students who play with Desmos or play with graphing software will find this a little bit off-putting and a little bit confusing. Just notice that with D, this just goes on forever, right? You cannot make the graph flip over using D. Whereas with A, you can cause a stretch. The stretches, stretch seems to happen not so quickly but then you can flip the whole graph over when A is negative and notice that what appears to be a shift, which what we're calling a vertical stretch, happens more slowly. And um, it's actually kind of, um, it's easier to see when you study logarithms in, um, in advanced functions. So we're we're not going to talk about A being a horizont uh, horizontal shift, okay? Uh, we will just talk about A being a stretch just like every other function we've seen. And you're, you're not wrong for saying that. Um, as we saw that when you have A equals 10, it is exactly like multiplying the Y value by 10 in the parent function. So it's not wrong. It's, uh, you're, still, you're still not being led astray. Okay, so now, um, so that's D. D is only responsible for a left and right word shift. Unlike A, it doesn't flip anything over. Um, so we'll just put that back to zero. And then C is the upward and downward shift. Notice that we, using a downward shift, an appropriate downward shift, like say minus two, for one thing, the horizontal asymptote is at minus two. But also, um, the y-intercept gets moved around. That's another thing. Um, and also, uh, something that maybe you're not used to seeing. We actually have an x-intercept. We have a case where y equals 0, <laughs> um, which we haven't seen. I mean, we can flip a. You, you can't see that by manipulating a, or at least not alone. And you can't see it by manipulating k, at least not alone. We haven't, we haven't messed with k yet. We haven't made k negative yet. But at any rate, uh, there's c. And uh, notice we can now here, if it's if the horizontal asymptote is above the x-axis, it'll never go to zero. But when the horizontal asymptote is a negative y value, 
it does go to zero. It goes to zero right over here at this strange looking number, 0.631. Um, so what is that number? How do we how do we solve that? How do we algebraically show that? Um, I'm going to once again go into OneNote and uh, let's see if I can. Let's just get rid of this. Um, so we have uh, what did we say? It was C, so 3 to the x minus 2. It's really just 3 to the x minus 2. That's all we have here. 3 to the x minus 2. And how do we make that equal to 0? Well, we can see that 3 to the x, if we subtract 2 from both sides, equals positive 2. Now, the problem here is, um, you can sense that there is a solution here for x. And without logarithms, and because you're not going to learn logarithms in this course, how do you, how on earth do you get 3 to the x to equal 2? Besides looking at Desmos and just getting the answer right away, my only solution to you, sir and madam, uh, watching this video is guess and check. Just use guess and check. That's all you're using here. Okay. There's no no magic. Okay. So we know, for example, we know that three, three to the zero is one, which is less than two. Three to the one is three. Right. Three to the power one is three, which is greater than two. So you at least have a number less than two and greater than two. You have you know that the answer, you know that x has to be a number between 0 and 1, right? Because 3 to the 0 is 1, which is below what you want. It's below your target. And 3 to the 1 is 3, which is above your target. So you know your answer is between 0 and 1. You just have to guess and check to figure out gradually, within a few decimal places, um, what that is. Uh, logarithms are the only other way to do this algebraically, um, but guessing and checking is the great 11 way of doing it, okay? So we're just going to stick with that. Okay, so that's the, that's that. All right, um, so that's C. Uh, we didn't uh, manipulate K. Notice that K can also do what appears to be a vertical stretch, but it's not. It's, well, we're not saying that it is. We're going to interpret this as a horizontal compression, right? So the higher K goes, the more horizontally compressed the curve gets. And of course, when K is less than one and greater than zero, it gets very, very much less compressed. And then when K is negative, it flips over on the Y axis, right? And the higher K goes in the negative direction, or the more negative K gets, the more compression you get in the opposite direction. Okay, well, the more compression you get uh, of the curve. But as always, when K is a number between negative one and one, or sorry, negative one and zero, um, you get a curve which is um, less compressed. So you can deal with combinations of transformations. Um, Let's, uh, let's make these into whole numbers. So what's this? How do we write this as a, how do we, how do we write this as a function? Um, let's take a look at what we're doing. So over here, we have, well, f of x is just three to the x, right? The only thing is we have a 3 in front. So we have really 3 times 3 three to the x. That's, that's what the a, that's what a equals 3, right? Sorry, I'm using my mouse as a pen and I'm running into problems here. It looks like a child's scribble. 
But anyway, um, so that's 3 times 3 to the x. So this is our first thing. Now k is 4, right? So this is now 3 times 3 because k is passed into inside the f of x brackets. It's actually 3 to the 4x. Okay, so now that's a and k, right? Now let's look at d. d is also passed into the brackets, but it's subtracted directly from x in a bracket. So we get here 3 times 3 to the 4 outside bracket x minus 4. Oh, sorry, x minus well, d is minus 2, so the minus 2 makes this minus into a positive, so this is a, this becomes x plus 2. And then the c just becomes something you subtract from the whole function, and we got a minus 1. So our new function, f of uh, g of x, is this new function. This is g of x. It's rather unfortunate I chose a 3 as my a, but um, you can actually simplify this function because of laws of exponents. Remember this 3 is like 3 to the 1. So it's like, it's like, adding, um, it's like adding exponents. So you can actually rewrite this without any coefficients. 3 to the, well, 4x is 4x and then 4 times 2 is 8, and then we add 1 is 9. So we have 4x plus 9 minus 1. And that's our resulting function. Uh, excuse the crazy handwriting. It's not really handwriting. It's more like mouse writing uh, in more ways than one, I guess. Um, and that's our new function. This is our new function simplified. Uh, using a little bit of plugging in and laws of exponents and a little bit of dead mass and that's what you get. Okay, so that's if you wanted to write the new function, if you wanted to figure out what kind of function you wrote, this is your function. Your parent function, remember, was this guy over here. Okay? Alright, so that was your, your original f of x. This is g of x, this is the result we end up with after doing all those transformations that we just did in Desmos. All right, I am going to stop here. Uh, your homework is, um, to be honest with you, I don't want to get too bogged down in, because you guys are doing a uh, assignment for me, uh, I don't want to get too bogged down in this section. So you're just doing the exercises in section A. Uh, I'm not too concerned about the rest of it. Uh, although, um, we could say you can do uh, numbers 1 through 10. I'm not going to ask you about um, I'm not going to ask you about uh, the rest of it. Although I could, I'm tempted to, but I'd like to get on with uh, section 3.6, which is in the next video.